So, Todd, you're in charge of innovation. What uh, changes have you been seeing lately that you think are going to start showing up in facilities? Well, definitely the, um, the building techniques that have changed over the past 30 years have driven a lot of these changes. So as the buildings become tighter and more and better insulated, um, the need for mechanical ventilation and bringing in outside air mechanically is necessary. And as buildings become more insulated, um, the heat load inside the building is reduced and therefore um, the air conditioning has to run less. But the air conditioning historically has been the primary way to control humidity. So with a lower heat load, um, but same, same level of humidity, um, dealing with humidity specifically uh, decoupled from the temperature load has become more and more, uh, more and more important. Interesting. So if I'm understanding correctly, the, the buildings have gotten better at both maintaining a temperature, which means the air conditioning is running less frequently, Correct. which means some of what we're used to, which is our air conditioning is going to automatically be dehumidifying while controlling the temperature is going to be, is going to happen less. Correct. Is that the way to think of it? Exactly. And same thing with fresh air. So the tide of the buildings, you know, as building construction becomes better and the code becomes better, there's less natural leakage in the building. Uh, and so you, you know, code is requiring at a certain level of construction, uh, mechanical ventilation. So when you mechanically ventilate, you have to maintain your equipment and make sure your actuators or your fresher actuators are working and the filters have been replaced uh, and are up to date because you're bringing in outside air and you want to make sure you're filtering that air um, and you want to make sure you bring in the right volume of that air. So just by way of an example, if a building were not to bring in any fresh air and it was fairly tightly sealed, what would that turn, like what would accumulate? What would be the, the downside? Well, that essentially is what sick building syndrome is. Okay. So what happens is um, you get high levels of VOC and off-gassing uh, from internal uh, furniture and cleaning agents. Um, you don't have enough, uh, you get high levels of CO2, um, and really the building is not purging the air enough, right? And you're not getting enough turnover of the air, and uh, you get short-term issues of uh, dizziness, scratchy throat, nausea, nausea uh, all the way to uh, long-term health issues. So, I mean, you're really describing sick building syndrome there. Let's take it even a little further and look at it the opposite way. Let's take the older buildings. The older buildings have tons of infiltration, and I think people forget that maintaining that building envelope, your attic, your attic insulation, your siding, your insulation, any of the ceiling and caulking to prevent that infiltration, uh, uh, is detrimental. Poor infiltration can take an HVAC system that's been good as your building's degraded and turn it into something that can't keep up you know, with what's going on and then add to that over the last 15 years the design degree temperature and humidity days have climbed in numbers and climbed in quantity of degrees. Can, can in I interrupt you real levels. quick? Can mm -hmm. you define that? The, the temperature Something degree days is what yeah, you Yeah, so when we design buildings and we look at buildings, the engineer looks at the local code, the most recent code as the time the building was designed, and we have a parameter, a setting, based on the area of the country, based on so like the temperature fluctuations in the area. area. Yep. That's correct. Yep. Okay. That adapts to the climate. Those have changed over the last 15 years. Yep. And now when a building had a system that could keep up, it no longer can keep up. Interesting. Yeah, so a great example of that is as your building envelope deteriorates and you get more infiltration, it shows up in the winter time uh, in excessively uh, dry conditions because you, your heating system can make up the, the temperature loss, right? So as we're leaking out our warm air and bringing in cold outside air, the heating system can make up for that, but you're losing the humidity. And so you end up getting really dry interior conditions and people complain about that, right? There's, there's nose and throat issues with excessively low humidity. Are there other uh, issues in terms of what's in the air when humidity gets really low? So that, that's a good point. So extremely low relative humidity, um, that can drive um, bad outcomes uh, with pathogens, right, and sicknesses. Um, it definitely can drive issues with your sinus systems and your skin too, right? So it makes you more susceptible to uh, sickness. Even levels of PM 2.5 and lower, uh, you know, as an example, when it's really dry, if you watch the sun coming through a window and look at all that dust that's dancing in the sunbeam, and you try to reach up and grab it, what happens? Your hand goes through it, it whirls around, it comes back behind your hands, right? Um, and the more, the drier it is, the more it floats around, the harder it is to capture. That stuff's hard to capture, period, anyway, you know. 